Hello, everybody, and welcome to this introduction and overview session of the Certificate Programs in Python for Algorithm Trading, Computational Finance, and Brand New Asset Management. My name is Eve. I'm founder and CEO of the Python Quants and the iMachine. I will not only guide you through today's session, but also through the complete program. As usual, I'm pretty excited when we get started with the new cohort because we always have something new that we add to the program or also uh, yeah, module sessions, whole classes that we update. And this is uh, the same uh, this time around. And in particular, what I'm excited about is that we now have uh, three specializations. Right? So in addition to algorithmic trading, computational finance, we now have also asset management. This is an area that's growing in importance, uh, not only for us, but I think Python has now also a strong foothold in this part of the industry. Therefore, pretty excited. Um, and yeah, let's get started. I have quite a bit on the agenda for today. So um, should not lose more time and dive into first the agenda. So yeah, quick introduction. Then we uh, have a yeah, broad overview of the program. I will briefly discuss our quant platform 2.0, as we call it. So it's the second generation of our platform. We have a new class that we started with the recent cohort. This is Mathematics Basics. Uh, uh, there, there we have received quite a good feedback. So in terms of uh, refreshing uh, fundamental math topics and, uh, of course, using Python in this context, uh, Finance with Python, uh, our base class which lays the foundations uh, for everything else uh, to come. There's also my new book coming out, which is uh, actually the basis for this class. It's called in book form financial theory with Python. Then we have tools and skills where we will update uh, at least larger parts of the materials. Python for financial data science. Uh, I think this is bread and butter <laughs> for the financial uh, analysts, for the quant, for the algo trader, right? You need to be able to uh, yeah, crunch numbers to process uh, data. This is what uh, 0.7 is about, Python for Excel. Um, also kind of exciting because uh, Excel is still omnipresent in our industry. And today you have powerful tools with something in the form of the package Excel Wings, which allows you to, uh, yeah, Harness and leverage the power of Python for your Excel-based applications. Python for databases, similar vein. So here uh, we might deal with even larger data sets. Uh, natural language processing, also, I would say a smaller class, but what we provide in this class it puts you already in a position that you're able to uh, not only crunch numbers, but also to process uh, larger uh, chunks of, uh, yeah, unstructured data, as they call it. AI in finance here is not, uh, so to say, in the middle of the screen, in the middle of the agenda. It's basically now at the core of so many things that we do in combination with reinforcement learning. Uh, for example, it provides a uh, background for different strategies that we cover in Python for algo trading, Python for computational finance. Um, this is actually where I'm coming from. And where many um, yeah, have used maybe for the first time uh, Python in the industry. Uh, yeah process data and to, for example, um, yeah, support trading, support pricing, support valuation, and to support risk management, for example. Python for asset management, set before now, uh, a certificate in and of itself. Of course, the platinum package uh, combines the three specializations into a larger one. Case studies and demos, then a quick view at the study plan, to which you all have access. Uh, of course, uh, got some guiding principles as a background. Um, and yeah, the reviews, exercise, and test projects that we provide so that you can basically on a weekly basis test yourself and see how far you have come and how many skills you have already acquired. Last but not least, two important topics, user forum, uh, which is uh, of course open 24-7 and Discord server that you can use for everything else that is beyond a technical and content questions. Yeah, that's quite a bit. So I won't spend too much time on the single um, points there, right? Um, so uh, it's just, again, the introduction and the overview, of course, uh, behind every agenda point here, there's typically a larger set of resources, um, but we just want to have a glimpse at what is behind it so that you have really like an overview and uh, can orient yourself uh, quite a bit better in this uh, context. Right? So that's the idea of today's Session. Quick introduction for those who might not have heard uh, that much about what we are doing. Python quants here, yeah, you see, uh, we cover quite a couple of topics, but all the topics are centered around Python for finance. Right? So that's the that's our core topic, and we provide services to financial institutions, 
training programs such as the ones um, that we are now starting here with the third cohort for 2021. Uh, we run platforms for browser-based analytics, but also for trading, uh, open source content libraries. We have uh, published a bunch of books, provide certifications, and we also run events. So um, this is basically what we do. But again, we have this uh, common denominator, if you like, it's uh, Python for Finance. You find on every page here the introduction links if you are interested in a bit more than the AI machine. This is an outgrowth of our algorithmic training endeavors, uh, where we have um, yeah, built a platform for Python and AI-powered algorithmic trading. Because I always, uh, and not me personally, but many people out there uh, face the same issue when they get started with Python for algorithmic trading. It's the deployment gap, or the last mile problem, I like to call it, that you basically can do uh, quite efficiently. Um, um, yeah, some analysis uh, can evaluate backtest strategies, but once you are ready to deploy them, this is much more involved and much harder in general than to do the analysis itself. And this is what the AI machine is about. Here, also a quick overview, just a two minute read with the link if you're interested to follow along. Uh, too long to read here. Um, in the middle, you see my uh, books. I go through them in a bit more detail, but just for you as reference. Those of you who haven't met me, maybe, or haven't heard me uh, speaking or teaching here, a bit more background information, right? So that's the brand new book. Um, it will uh, come out soon. Uh, it's not a matter of months anymore. It's a matter of weeks only. Uh, the book, basically, the manuscript is finished. I'm now in what's called the quality control phase, uh, where I review the uh, edits, the recent, most recent edits. And uh, again, the process is now going publish. Uh, publishing is uh, yeah, in, in full uh, process, full steam ahead here. And uh, I'm pretty excited uh, to publish yet another book. And it is basically um, the, yeah, the most basic book or put the other way around, it covers the most basic topics. And if you have uh, ever read maybe my quote unquote best selling book, Python for Finance, uh, financial theory of Python is actually starting uh, quite a bit before that. So um, I could also say that uh, you should maybe first read financial theory with Python now that's coming out and then move on to Python for Finance, which covers then in more detail um, the most uh, popular packages such as Pandas, uh, NumPy, et cetera, and also covers computational finance as well as algorithmic training, right? Um, so that, that would be my recommended sequence. Uh, then you can, for example, dive deeper here with books uh, about quant finance, uh, the relative analytics with Python and the volatility and variance derivatives. This is quite involved on the mathematical side. So all computational finance classes and the books are say, the, the, the most demanding ones from uh, the financial uh, side of things, right? In terms of math that is required. Uh, um, also in terms of the implementation of the mathematical and financial concepts, right? But uh, we go through all the details, of course, also in the program, uh, both with regard to the left-hand book as well as with regard to the orange one on the right-hand side. Then the two books that came out last year, uh, Python for Algorithmic Trading. This is a process-oriented book, which starts at the very beginning with uh, maybe some uh, yeah, data processing and, and idea generation and ends with the cloud deployment, right? This is what you need in the end. So you probably don't want to run the strategies uh, on a local machine. You rather want to run it in the cloud. And this is uh, today uh, kind of easy and also cheap. I can really say cheap because you can get started in the cloud with say some uh, five US dollar per month uh, when you rent like a small droplet with DigitalOcean. Um, that we cover, for example, so this is uh, by no means uh, prohibitively expensive or whatnot. So this is um, actually, um, yeah, the basic idea. Um, there are questions with regard to, or maybe issues with regard to audio. Uh, maybe if you can confirm that the audio is okay, this would be great uh, from my end. It looks at least as if everything should be okay. Yeah, uh, also, of course, uh, these two books, uh, yeah, not only uh, used as a reference, but basically they are an outgrowth of the classes that I've been teaching uh, for years. And uh, in turn now, they have become the major references for the classes with the same names. And of course, we, we add uh, quite a bit more in this uh, context, right? So the program itself, again, just like a high level overview, 
uh, every once in a while, I'm updating these numbers uh, so they should uh, just give you um, yeah, a rough idea. So 60 weeks, that's uh, the only number that is fixed. Everything else is always in flux because we add code, we add Jupyter notebooks, we add classes. So um, here, this is growing and growing. And of course, we replace uh, here and there stuff. So uh, every once in a while, what I said before, you know, there's of course the need because uh, there's progress with regard to software, uh, packages, uh, projects etc maybe new tools that are coming out right um, and uh, there's a need to update so uh, this just as uh, a glimpse at what to expect if you have for example uh, the platinum package with all the resources I write here 10,000 lines of code uh, <laughs> probably it's uh, it's uh, two three four times as as much actually when we would do a proper counting therefore the plus here another view right we have uh, the codes of course we have the, the recorded live uh, instructions so we cannot do everything live again and again <clears throat> it's well too much so and you will have uh, between two to four live sessions per week uh, and everything else is recorded uh, you have other resources like the notebooks on the Quant platform. You have texts on the Quant platform as reference. But of course, uh, you can also rely on the books themselves these days, maybe uh, more and more also in electronic form instead of the printed ones. In particular, the Python for Finance one uh, with the 710 pages. It's quite heavy to carry around. If you have it as a desktop reference, that's nice. But for example, if you are uh, uh, commuting in the morning again after uh, maybe the, uh, the recent period, uh, then it might be a bit heavy to carry around. So why Python for Finance? Why do we do all this? Yeah, the industry simply uh, has moved in that direction. So Python is omnipresent. And not only the hardcore developers, um, the, um, the programmers, uh, the backend, DevOps, etc. the Python in the front office. And in basically every uh, situation where data plays a role, Python is these days, um, yeah, basically mandatory right uh, so hundreds of new investment bankers it's already in 2018 so we've come a long way and it has become more more important uh, of new investment bankers and asset managers undergo mandatory training and the mandatory training here is with regard to python programming and uh, of course once you have the language the programming language itself available then it's kind of like natural to move on towards more data science related topics or machine learning ones or uh, cloud computing and all these important concepts. So the biggest banks um, down to the smaller, maybe investment uh, hedge fund shops, for example, they all use uh, Python these days. Some almost exclusively, uh, there are a couple of examples, but uh, basically uh, every institution today in certain instances. Here, graduates with tech and finance skills uh, in high demand. So tech comes first here. So tech plus finance. Uh, what has indeed been the domain of the rocket scientists, right? Uh, writing pricing code, for example, in C++, um, is not the domain of these uh, highly specialized um, people anymore, right? Uh, again, what uh, basically you can think of it like what Excel has been in the past is now basically uh, Python with all packages and, and the techniques and approaches around that, such as from machine learning, deep learning, etc., right? And of course, AI becomes more and more important. Another quote, I leave here the old one so that uh, the, the old, by old I mean 2018, 2019, so I use these uh, since quite a while, uh, so that uh, we see this is not something that has just uh, yeah, come to life uh, last month. Basically, this is around. And um, when it was like uh, a, a couple of years ago, something like a, a nice to have or an add on skill um, that people were happy about, these days is simply required. Right. So uh, again, we've come a long way, and it's not only uh, basic programming, uh, data science. It's, it's uh, yeah, we need uh, in certain instances maybe even black belt level. And uh, our hope is, our goal is, uh, our primary goal is, uh, yeah, to bring you to brown belt or even black belt level in the one or the other discipline that is so important to you. So Quant platform. 2.0, everybody has access to the Quant platform, and on the Quant platform, you find um, uh, basically all the resources in text form, in code form, uh, in video form, right, and uh, the user forum, and quite a bit more. So that's the central content and code execution platform. So for the very beginning, what is basically on the uh, study plan, yeah, basically everything can be executed and done on the Quant platform. Later on, there are so topics where we would expect you to do stuff locally, uh, where you maybe work uh, with Docker, for example, 
and do your stuff there. But the Quant platform is your central repository. And also when you have questions or when you're studying locally and you have questions, use, make use of the user forum. Not only our team helps you out, uh, we have in the meantime also kind of a yeah, active community where people uh, help each other out or maybe delegates from previous cohorts that still use a platform and, and study on the platform uh, after a couple of months or some even after years. Um, yeah, that might be uh, pretty fast and helpful uh, in helping you out when you face any technical issues. There is a link behind that, but everybody has received the link anyway. It's in registration or later on as well which gives you a brief overview so at this point i just want to have a, a brief look at the quant platform here so i have it open already so i'm logged in usually when we have a live session uh, you find here the latest video since we are starting out uh, fresh uh, we'll put mathematics basics or one here because uh, that's the one uh, which i recommended you get started uh, beforehand uh, on the dashboard so to say you have the latest uh, forum posts there uh, sometimes also technical issues are mentioned or here cannot run the code um, on a certain page or videos. Recently, there was an issue with the videos, right? There were like two uh, redundant posts, but um, in the user forum, which you see here, there's much, much more, right? So uh, finance with Python related, uh, data science, algo trading, AI and finance, uh, computational finance, and more, you see, uh, just recently added Python for asset management tools and skills. So you find basically for every uh, topic here, the um, related boards. And when you go to the board, you see upper right-hand side here, the button where you can create a new topic. Um, and then you're good to go, right? So we get notified by email. So <laughs> don't think that we need to check here regularly every hour or what. So we get notified by email. And when you post, for example, uh, something in a thread, you will also get notified when uh, somebody um, yeah, puts uh, yeah, a new comment or an, yeah, an answer to your question uh, in such a um, thread. So the most important parts with regard to content beyond the user forum, which I just showed, um, is found here. On the courses, oh, this is a little bit of a, a name based on how we um, named them in previous times. So basically here you find the text AI in finance, finance with Python, Python for finance, Python for algorithmic trading. So let's maybe get started with uh, finance with Python. So this was uh, here, the version was updated February 2021 when it was uh, updating uh, the manuscript uh, for the book and you find here the text. So when you, for example, in the study plan, see uh, you should read uh, chapter one, two and three, which let's say uh, here you find one, two and three um, in the HTML form, which is of course uh, searchable and has uh, cross links here within the document, um, et cetera. So that's the reading material. And when I scroll down a little bit further after the general introduction, you will see there is some math. Uh, and then there is also some code that comes here. And you don't need to uh, worry about copying the code. Of course, sometimes uh, for exercise purposes, you might be inclined to uh, type it on your own. Uh, but there is basically no need because we, as I've shown before, we provide, of course, the code. Uh, so it's not like a printed book. Uh, we have the luxury here of being on a digital platform. And when you see this, for example, um, here the text is open in a uh, different uh, tab, right? Um, I can, uh, beyond the text, I also have um, the videos, of course. So we would see in the study plan, not only reading assignments, uh, for sure not. Uh, there is here also the uh, trainings part. When I click here on Finance with Python, then on the platform right here, the modules, as we call them, basically the sessions, the recorded ones, pre-recorded ones open. And you have Finance with Python 01, 02, or 03. And you can get started viewing the first video by just clicking on it here. So um, they are, depending on the class, they're usually one and a half hours, so some 90 minutes. Uh, newer classes like Mathematics Basics, which I will uh, cover a bit later, um, they have uh, maybe just one hour, 60 minutes, right? And so you can uh, go through it. So there have been quite a couple of requests recently with regard to, oh, it's now providing some audio, we don't need that. Um, uh, recently that people want to uh, speed up the playback. So we replaced just recently the um, 
um, the video player. So we have been working on that. Um, you have seen a couple of posts in the user forum, right? Videos here and there. So this was a transition phase. And uh, now we have the new video player. And I know many of you, uh, for example, when I listen to podcasts, usually I also listen to 1.5, sometimes depending on the podcast, two times. So uh, here you have now the option to speed up things a bit if you think uh, you want to go through it faster or for example if you want to review something and say well I've listened to it once uh, and watched it once so let's now go back and for a second time and then you can maybe do it fast so all the videos are here and you see also uh, links for example here is a slide deck that has been used uh, for this session for that session right and here finance with python book finance with python demo so there when the says demo it is often like a live demo which is uh, coded live in the session but here for example when i go to um o1 finance so i just need to click once no double click required it now opens in the cloud in a docker container uh, my jupyter lab uh, where i said before you basically don't need to in the beginning at least not install anything locally if you haven't any Python installation yet. I want to focus first on the Python side of things. This takes a little bit because there is like a complete, yeah, a complete uh, a Docker environment plus your own uh, files plus your training resources, which is now connected here. Therefore, uh, if you haven't done so, so I have closed it purpose. Uh, oh, what is happening here? So this is like the, the demonstration effect. <laughs> I don't know why, why it has done that here. Um, <laughs> I've just checked it before, but as usual, right? So let me open Jupyter Lab directly. What via the a notebook link and uh, what I was saying just before is when it is open already, uh, reopening it or reaccessing it is usually a bit faster. So I, what I was saying, I have uh, shut down my Jupyter uh, Lab server purposefully, and um, uh, therefore the startup might uh, take a bit longer in this context. Yeah, so we have on the Quant platform um, the videos, the texts, links to further resources, the notebooks, uh, the user forum, <laughs> basically everything uh, that you might find in the study plan. And I now have uh, mentioned it so often that I might uh, simply put it up. Let me have uh, um, a quick look at it here. That's the current study plan. And uh, I'm going to increase this a little bit for better readability. You see a finance with Python 01, finance with Python chapters 1 to 3. This is the reading assignment, right? These are the videos. This is also explained in the text above. Um, here you see the live sessions for um, week one, uh, financial data science, tools and skills, something that we're going to do live again. Um, and here AI and finance book and AI and finance, there's two different classes. I'll come to that uh, later on. So um, this is basically the program for week one. It's not too much, but it's already, Quite a bit of a workload, right? In particular, when you when you want to get into the rhythm here, uh, that's um, that's already quite a bit. So, uh, finance with Python reading assignment, uh, video recordings that you are supposed uh, to watch, and my Jupyter notebook. I'm surprised we checked it before. It does not work at this point. So, let me quickly check um, with the team why this is not working. Quite a bit surprised here. Um, I should get this up and running shortly again. So, study plan, maybe I simply leave it here because I will uh, reference it probably a couple of times. Uh, the text here um, that should be fine. Um, should be fine and again here the overview video which is maybe a bit more detailed uh, also with regard to how to work on, on the lab for example but don't worry we will cover all the tools and everything in detail anyway so mathematics basics that's um, a new class that we have uh, recently um, added so we started with that in the previous cohort and we have done 25 sessions and still counting um, and when I go to the platform instead of PinPy, trainings, math basics, right? So you would see that this is one of the longest classes that we have. So uh, while PinPy has six sessions only as a starting point, here we cover different mathematical topics in some detail. Of course, math is a pretty, pretty broad area. 
but I try to select those topics that are, of course, important for what we do, right? In particular, you know, computational finance, where we need a little bit more math, but also for the other areas, such as asset management, for example, uh, where math plays obviously a role as well. Um, so here we will add uh, more, and we don't do only, let's say, pure Python. We use NumPy. We will uh, add SciPy to the mix. Uh, also do some stuff with uh, pandas and also symbolic Python uh, with SymPy. That's actually um, what we are um, going to do in this class. So again, there is already quite a bit. I would recommend I don't have this on the study plan um, because you should go through this. You can do this uh, upfront, maybe in bulk if you have time, uh, or you simply can do it um, yeah, in parallel with everything else. But I didn't want to overload the uh, study plan in this regard. So you have access, of course, to the resources and uh, you should go through them. But here, I guess this is kind of a wonderful class where you have uh, quite a bit of flexibility. And it's some of the sessions are built on top of each other. Um, but it's not really necessary to go uh, sequentially here. Of course, what would be recommended would be great, but uh, no uh, real need in this um, context right so that's the mathematics basics class with um, the code with the resources um, etc yeah finance with python we've covered this already in detail uh, on the platform um, this uh, yeah introduces financial theory based on simple math and simple python programming that's the basic idea right uh, we have the most simple economy where we still can analyze uh, uncertainty that in complete markets, we analyze agent decision making based on the expected utility uh, paradigm and uh, end basically here with dynamic economies such as the binomial uh, tree model from Coxos Rubinstein, uh, 1979, and uh, a Monte Carlo version of the um, Monte Carlo version of the uh, Black Scholes Merton model for option pricing, right? Geometric brown motion, but we don't do stochastic calculus or the advanced stuff here. This is introductory and everything that we can do discrete time, uh, discrete state space, uh, not relying on advanced math uh, is covered here on the introductory level. Also, mean variance, portfolio theory, capital asset pricing model, and these uh, typical yeah, cornerstones and fundamental building blocks of finance. You have seen the resources, we have text, we have um, uh, videos um, plus a code and you have on the on the Jupyter lab or also for download of course if you want to download something you can do that as well so once you have your uh, full-fledged environment running on your local machine you can of course uh, download uh, materials and resources and execute it there or re-implement it again I said usually you probably wouldn't do it like type everything that you see for example in the text but sometimes this might make sense. So tools and skills is something that we are um, going to do at least in uh, what I'm saying in larger parts um, life. Again, because there are many things that change. So for example, uh, this is now for the first time, <laughs> first cohort that I use uh, the most recent iteration of uh, the Mac uh, world with the M1 chip. So what they call Apple Silicon. Uh, in the beginning, there were a couple of tools that took a while until they were available and, and full-fledged executable, such as um, yeah, Docker, for example, that you see here. Um, also, TensorFlow took a while until a proper installation, also TensorFlow for, from Google for deep learning was away. But uh, we have come a long way, and uh, the new world is now, I think, uh, almost fully comparable to the old um, uh, Intel-based world of Apple, and uh, basically the new versions are simply faster. So when I was preparing, for example, on the M1, um, uh, let's say uh, a notebook uh, with uh, uh, yeah, some time measurements, and I executed it on my i7 Mac afterwards, I always saw that it was uh, quite a bit, sometimes much slower as compared to the M1 world. So um, and on average, they have become also a bit cheaper, actually, uh, which I think is a good value proposition in this context. Here we cover, as you can see, uh, things like Python environments, cloud usage, um, et cetera, uh, code editing with WIM, uh, screen WIM plus Q as a lightweight tool chain, as I call it, doc test, unit test, Git version control, Python packaging, documentation, code hosting. Uh, this might not be relevant for everybody, right? But uh, we offer it because we know, for example, when you work in a larger 
a company and you're not maybe let's say active in open source uh, development still for a large company where you want to share your packages with uh, colleagues and you need to do proper documentation also testing and you might be working in a team uh, you might need git version control uh, all these elements might be uh, important maybe not for everyone again but in particular in large organizations these are all uh, important topics and here you see what the typical elements are, uh, Jupyter Notebooks, uh, Terminal Editor, IPython WIM, and um, of course, it needs a Python interpreter, and uh, we also cover Docker containers, which are so powerful, and in particular, with the goal of deploying uh, strategies in the cloud digital ocean here in this, uh, in this uh, context, right? Related to the mathematics basics one, um, whether there is stochastic calculus refresher, we cover a bit of stochastic calculus in the computational finance and uh, DX analytics part, uh, but in, in the mathematics basics part, we haven't reached any any kind of stochastic calculus in this uh, context. It's also not, uh, I mean, it's uh, indeed the minority of our delegates uh, that really go deep into the computational finance area. Uh, but I'm open to maybe later on add also uh, <laughs> beyond the math basics, uh, also some advanced stuff in this uh, context. Yeah, maybe just a quick run through how such an installation uh, works. So I have here I have here a, a terminal open. And I want to run a Docker container. So again, this is just for you to get a glimpse on what to expect there, right? I'm not expecting you now to follow along with nothing that I'm going to present. It's just like uh, to show that certain things are not really um, so demanding as they might look on, on the first the first side. Here I start a Docker container. Why do I start a Docker container? Yeah, here I'm on a Mac machine, and of course I have uh, some Python installation here up and running, right? It's, it's what I work on on a daily basis. And um, um, when I run a Docker container with Ubuntu, you see here Ubuntu latest is the operating system. I start basically from scratch. So now it says root cert before it was mini one. And one live, that's the folder, if it's the username, right? And now I'm in the Linux world. So this looks completely different for those of you who have worked Linux machines, all this, uh, it's probably business as usual when you see that, right? So I can go maybe to the root folder, which is in my case, since I've logged in as root, is my home folder, which you see here indicated by the tilde, actually. And um, <laughs> if Python, would have been installed before I could simply type Python here, right? So maybe I go a little bit larger um, and do the same trick so that you can see it a bit better. So Python command not found. So it's actually simply not installed. So I want to now just show that within a few minutes, I can get started here with Python. So first I do my housekeeping, up update just like system update first the package index and then i do an upgrade usually for these base containers it's not that much to upgrade it takes a few seconds i mean it depends on the speed of your um, internet connection so this is already it i now need to install a little tool wget Confirm up front and it installs wget. This is a simple Linux tool and this philosophy of Linux tools, they do one trick only in general and try to do this as good as possible. And the one trick of the wget um, uh, tool um, is to retrieve files from the web, right? So when I now go to the Miniconda page, see here a few bookmarks, conda.io, Miniconda. This is all covered in the tools and skills class. You see these days a bunch of installers now, um, Windows installers, Mac OS X installers, Linux installers, right? And now I'm on a Mac machine, but I'm in a Docker container. And uh, let's say I would like to go with maybe not the latest here. I would like to, oh, let's go with the latest. So Python 3.9, uh, Linux 64 bit. Linux here on R, so you see here on the different um, architectures, right? So 
let me maybe go, I think that one, since I'm on M1, I mentioned it before, it's for the first time that I work regularly on M1s. Let me try that one and whether it works. Otherwise I would maybe need to uh, repeat it in this context. So I first retrieve it. Again, this takes a bit depending on your uh, connection. And now I try to execute it, mini condo. Let's see if this works on Arch. So now license agreement for the first time you should read it carefully all right and let's see if this all goes through here it asks me um for the install location usually i go with the default miniconda 3 here it now um yeah you see a bunch of packages getting installed i say yes to initialize it now it says it has finished, but before there was like a warning that uh, we should uh, maybe restart or in initialize, right? Here you see it, right? For the changes, this is what I was looking for. Take effect, close and reopen your current shell. So meaning that when I now type Python, it still doesn't find it, right? But let me go up there and I run now bash and it says base now. You see the change in prompt. So I've restarted the bash, the shell, and now it says base. So let me see Python and it's like magic. <laughs> Happy to have picked uh, obviously the right installer, Python 3.9.5 from 20th May 2021. Um, the compile time here, right? And now I can do my Python coding like hello. It's a difficult program that I get. First line of Python code basically after. I don't know, three minutes maybe, uh, I have a Python interpreter. So this is usually not any more these days what you would um, go with. So I exit here, this was just to check. Um, with Conda, I can install things like IPython, NumPy. Uh, IPython is a tool, NumPy is a package. So let's see what happens. Conda install, it now communicates with the server, it checks what is to be installed given what I have already installed. And I say, yes, so in general, we would simply go with it and say, yes, please go ahead. If we don't see anything suspicious, let's say. And when I now say IPython, oh, well, I'm now in IPython. You see already some coloring here. And when I type the same as before, so here, hello, Delegates maybe a little bit shorter. You see some syntax highlighting, right? And I can do my Python as well. So I sometimes or I quite often use this also as a calculator, right? Or three to the power of uh, seven, for example. And you can now uh, evaluate expressions, write your Python code, maybe define functions, etc. I can also now check whether my NumPy has been installed, SNP. The usual convention uh, seems to work and uh, random random and maybe some 10 random numbers and i can draw random numbers so these are uniformly distributed random numbers for example it's something that we cover in detail in um in the mathematics basics class but also in many many other uh, classes and, and areas and sections um random numbers with numpy and vectorized operations etc is uh, covered so you see here on linux i have started from scratch basically a, a minimal uh, linux environment um ubuntu based and i've downloaded the miniconda installer here for the uh, appropriate hardware infrastructure my apple silicon and I've executed it. You saw this was a matter of seconds. Um, I have confirmed a few things. I need to restart the bash. And uh, two installed packages, tools later, I can run IPython. I can draw my first random number. So getting up and running with the Python environment is, that's the message, not a big, the biggest deal anymore in um, yeah, today's world. Where it is from experience, usually a bit a bit more involved is on um, is on um, uh, yeah on Windows from experience. Um, we have seen this now here pretty straightforward. I would say these days Windows comes pretty close, but here and there you might run into issues. Oh, but, but we are going to cover uh, we are going to cover um, uh, Windows installations, of course, as well. Right. So once you have your Python environment up and running, 
right? Um, then you uh, you probably rely on it. Maybe you update a few things, but um, this is not something what I have now shown that you will do like let's say on a weekly basis, right? So on your local machine you do it in general once, and then there's some housekeeping, some some updating uh, here and there, and uh, you should be um, good to go for quite a little while. So here, um, this is what I used once. So again, uh, when I'm finished, I don't need uh, anything more here. More details in the tools and skills class, more resources, more background information. Um, also here, of course, with regard to different platforms and links uh, to resources, etc. Right? This is uh, what this class is about. Python for Financial Data Science. This is based on my Python for Finance book, basically the first uh, 13 chapters. Um, and this goes a bit deeper as compared to, I would say, math basics as compared to uh, finance with Python. So here we deal with uh, data types and structures in the beginning. Uh, we have a run through the most important uh, capabilities of NumPy and Pandas. We do some object-oriented programming. Uh, visualization, time series management, input output, for example, with pandas, uh, that's a wonderful combination when you want to read, let's say, large chunks of data in the form of CSV files or export data, performance Python, math tools. So <laughs> this is like one chapter in the, uh, in the book uh, and one session here, but with the math basics class, we have now much, much more um, um, content in this regard. Stochastics about simulation, random numbers, random variables, stochastic processes, statistics, and machine learning. I think it's self-explaining and a special dates and times. And there was a question with regard to the resources. Um, all the resources um, that are in your package, whatever the package is, um, are available basically indefinitely. So you will have indefinite access. I'm not saying that, for example, if we add some fancy new additional offering in the future, that this will be part of what you have. But if you have signed up and let's say Python for Financial Data Science is part of your program, then you will have indefinite access. Also maybe to uh, future updates in um, yeah, regards to uh, the class itself. Right, so that's uh, that's the basic um, the basic uh, idea that we have. So I know there are other programs where they say, well, you might have half a year or nine month, or one year access, and afterwards uh, you get quote unquote kicked out. Uh, right, this is not what we do. Um, to the contrary, again, you might have uh, even access later on to some updated content if this is uh, part of what you have been um, signing up for. Yeah, resources as before, we have text, we have code, we have recordings, we have additional links, additional resources, maybe like a data file, let's say, uh, or other stuff. So this varies a bit, but the basic structure is the same. You might have a text, maybe there's no text yet, so I'm still writing, right? Uh, you will always have video recordings in different classes, you will have um, uh, links uh, to additional resources plus the code that accompanies um, the class Python for Excel. This, of course, is something that you can only use with Excel. This is nothing that works, for example, on the Quant platform. What I was said, saying in the beginning that uh, when you get started, you can do basically everything on the Quant platform. Excel is something not, right? And I must also say um, that this works since it is a Windows-based uh, tool primarily. It's, of course, available for Mac OS as well, but it's a Microsoft tool to put it that way. It works best and, and has the, the largest set of capabilities on Windows machines. But again, um, uh, many functions in this context are also available on Mac. So, but um, the uh, classes here and, and uh, yeah, the highest benefit is achieved, uh, I must say, on Windows in this context. You don't need to do this if you say, well, I, I don't use Excel anymore these days. That's not. Um, um, nothing that I need anymore, right? Or I've never used it. Uh, that's fine. It's optional in the study plan, right? So when we have a look at the Chrome platform, here's the study plan. So when you see PyXL, you can get started here at the very beginning uh, because um, this starts gently, right? With very simple examples. <laughs> the, the most demanding thing here is to set everything up and uh, to configure everything. Um, but again, this is optional. If you say, well, uh, Maybe I want to do it later, maybe never. That's fine. So everything that's under optional 
uh, <clears throat> might be stuff that is here. Might be of interest, but currently I don't have a specific use case in this um, context. The same holds true for Python for databases. So with uh, pandas, I, I praised it before for the capabilities with regard to input-output operations, um, et cetera. Um, also in-memory capabilities, of course. Um, often we don't have a need for a database, but also often, or depending on the use case and the, and the scenario, you might want to work with a proper database, right? And candidates are SQL ones like SQLite or MySQL, uh, NoSQL databases um, like MongoDB, we covered just one in this context. Um, and yeah, PyTables, which is kind of a special, this is what's called a hierarchical database. And it's pretty, pretty fast compared to all the other options because it's a bit more specialized and what's called a binary storage. So it's a it's, uh, little overhead with SQL. You always have uh, overhead with regard to the structuring, the relations, et cetera, and the capabilities. Um, um, and uh, yeah, it's use case dependent. So I'm not saying the one is better than the other. I would say PyTables is faster if you just want to write uh, down uh, to disk um, uh, a NumPy array, for example, then PyTables much faster, right? You wouldn't probably need MySQL or whatnot, uh, but it's limited as compared to. Uh, yeah, MySQL and SQLite with regard to relations, uh, queries, etc. Um, SQL Alchemy, that's a, um, yeah, a uh, back-end agnostic front-end uh, where you can um, code. That's the idea. A practice is often a little bit different, but the idea is that you can code on the Python side and you can exchange backends, right? That you have uh, SQLite, uh, you get started with SQLite. Later on, you move on because your requirements are now... Uh, stronger or <laughs> have grown over time, right? Then, then you move on uh, to MySQL and simply exchange back. End. That's the theory. It's also pretty powerful, but um, yeah, it's nice, but it doesn't always work out of the box um, as you would expect it. But anyways, it's a wonderful tool. Uh, so I don't want to bash it. it, it it's a, yeah, it's, a, it's a, a wonderful value proposition that it's hard to implement. Let me put it that way. Bcalls is also pretty specialized and pretty fast. So it's a calling that data store, um, which is specialized. But if speed is of the essence, and maybe um, a speedy uh, a compression is of the essence, then Bcalls might be. So we have a menu of options. We compare them with regard to uh, yeah, storage usage, uh, means overhead, also with regard to speed, etc. But in the beginning, probably might not be the, the primary focus of your studies. But we have all the resources also put here together and you should have a bit of experience with cloud resources because this class is cloud-based because we don't want to uh, risk that you mess up your local installation um, with, um, uh, with uh, the stuff that is required there because you need to install a MySQL server and, and desktop uh, client, mean, et cetera. So therefore, once you know how to go with the cloud, that's a wonderful thing, actually. Natural language processing, I said this is a shorter class, but it covers quite uh, important stuff. It's, uh, currently, it has only uh, two sessions, and uh, so far, there haven't been uh, any requests to do more, because I think with the two sessions and the code uh, snippets, so um, convenience functions, et cetera, that we provide, you can get already quite far. So Python and Pandas, so we talk uh, about these, uh, yeah. About the combinations and these packages, NumPy, Pandas, etc. We usually have, at least myself, I have uh, numbers in the back of my head, but uh, lots and lots of data, pro more data than um, in structured form is today available in unstructured form. And this is where natural language processing comes into play, for example, in summarizing tags and coming up with keywords. We, we show how to generate uh, clouds. We also show how to um, come up with uh, network representations of text, etc. So that's, that's a pretty, pretty interesting topic. And what is also pretty interesting, of course, is AI and finance, right? So this has become uh, such an important um, uh, topic that it's really at the core of many things that we do. Of course, there is the book, which is an outgrowth of what we have been teaching over the years and now has become the basis for what we uh, teach, right? You have uh, access uh, to the text in this regard. Uh, of course, code, recordings, additional resources like slide decks, Jupyter Notebooks, and we have here two classes, which have a total of 24 module sessions. So 
the, the one that you find under optional, this is um, a class that builds primarily algorithms from scratch. So you, 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 you get a closer look behind the scenes as compared to the other class, which is more like the user and, and practitioner's perspective. Right, where we say, well, we have TensorFlow, we have scikit-learn, uh, what can we do with it? The other one implements a larger uh, Python classes, which uh, in turn implement then um, deep neural networks, which which are capable of training neural networks, etc. So you learn, so to say, yeah, more about the machine room than about the boat itself. <laughs> uh, you're not only a passenger, you, you might be your own engineer with one class and the other class is more an applied uh, or has more an applied perspective. Reinforcement learning, I think if we can talk about fun, I think this is one of the, the more fun um, classes. Uh, the background reinforcement learning, of course, is in, in Go, is in playing games such as the Atari games that you see here. So I, this was kind of for me, uh, for many others, I guess, uh, Milestone 2013, playing Atari games with uh, deep reinforcement learning and later on the success stories around Go, Alpha Go, and, even later, Alpha Zero, right? And here in this class, we indeed attack a couple of the games that are provided by the um, by uh, the Open AI gym environment, so gym like for exercising, for training, and that's exactly what it is. Uh, you have a wonderful API that you can use, and you can implement your reinforcement learning agents in order to learn how to play. For example, here the Lunar Lander. So these are the three games that we uh, tackle in this class before we move on to the finance uh, side of things there, right? And therefore, <laughs> we're saying, um, if we have fun in the program, uh, if Python itself is not fun enough, here we have a couple of games uh, where we can use Python to train agents that uh, learn to play the games in this, uh, in this uh, context, right? So that's uh, that class. This has some, um, let me think, I think it's nine sessions roughly like that. And then have here is a link behind that. Let me maybe open link and new tab. The Lunar Lander, that's a, a video recording. I think it starts playing. Um, and here you have a couple of options, right? Move it to the left, move it to the right. Um, elevate it, right? And uh, yeah, the agent learns how to land it without crashing it. That's the basic idea, right? So um, this one here is not <laughs> the most perfect um, pilot, but still, you see, it takes quite a bit. So <laughs> with better agents, uh, this is uh, much more smooth and, and much faster in this uh, in this uh, context, right? So um, this can be done better, but it just I, I I like this game. Like basically, when I was young, I when I was playing. Actually, um, I was playing uh, this game myself. So therefore, now it should now it should be finished. You see, this is really like um, this is uh, a bit of a, a slower, a slow flying, a very cautious uh, agent here in this um, context. So that much about playing games, right? Of course, <laughs> beyond playing games. Same set of resources um, in the book and finance. You find a chapter on reinforcement learning. Uh, you have the video recordings here. Uh, you have the code. You have the slide decks with background information, and you can um, you can um, yeah execute it locally or in the cloud. Sometimes in the cloud, uh, because the resources there are constrained, certain things like uh, training a reinforcement learning agent might take. Uh, <laughs> long, too long, or even prohibitively long, right? So therefore, this is uh, like, if you have a fast local machine, for example, I recommend that you do the reinforcement learning um, stuff basically um, locally rather than in the cloud where, again, the resources are limited by design in this uh, context. So Python for algorithmic trading, these are now the core classes. Um, Three core classes, three certificate programs, or if you went with the, with the platinum one, uh, you have uh, the three courses, uh, the three core classes at the same time. There is no need, although this is indicated in the study plan. Again, a quick glimpse at the study plan. 
here you see the, the core classes alongside each other. We start together for the first three weeks and with the first milestone, and then we separate into the, the core classes here. Um, there is no actual need to do them all at the same time. So if you say, and I know many of you are, everybody today, working, family commitments, etc., uh, where you say, well, uh, time is limited. Uh, I rather want to focus, let's say, here on asset management, that I want to move on to algo trading. And last but not least, uh, we do comp finance. That's perfectly fine, right? Uh, but uh, recall that at the end, you're supposed to write a final project, and this final project should be in one of these three uh, areas, right? So uh, that's the um, that's the idea. So if you say, well, I want to write my final project in Python asset management, then you should get started with Python asset management, and maybe do the other stuff a bit later. No harm in that, but if you say, well, I do vector as vector testing, but I want to write my final project uh, in asset management, this would maybe um, be like the uh, wrong um, sequence then for your specific uh, uh, goals in this context. Yeah, so um, the core class here, right? So um, These days, I can say the class is based on the book, but the book is basically an outgrowth of the class. Right? So I teach first, develop the materials, and then I write a book uh, on the topic. So we have here the foundations, of course. You're expected to have them available. Then we do vector as backtesting. So that, that's the reason why we get started with um, the three programs and Platinum uh, with the same stuff, right? To, to develop, build the foundations uh, so that we can later on um, uh, yeah, capitalize on what we have learned the beginning, vectorized backtesting, prediction-based trading, event-based backtesting. This is with regard to strategies. Algo trading here, uh, focusing on streaming, the platforms themselves, and automation and review. And here in this overview, I have like the experience phase uh, shown as well. So in a study plan, you only find here at the end plus four weeks practice and find a project phase. This is what I call experience here. Practice module one your own strategy, then you should deploy it and you should write the research paper. Just one comment because there are always questions, particularly on algo trading. Uh, can I do as a final project the deployment of my strategy? No, therefore I write your research paper. It should be reproducible research. It can be related, let's say, to backtesting uh, where you provide the data that you have been using, right? And um, uh, I can execute it and I can reproduce what you have been doing there. But it's not live trading, API access, and all these elements, which are so exciting here in this part, right? Real-time streaming, um, et cetera. This cannot be part. It should be, it must be reproducible in, um, this, um, in this particular case. The other practice modules in algo trading, um, this is about deployment. There you will have um, enough exposure. Um, where you can yeah, test your skills in the cloud with uh, running and monitoring uh, your strategies. Right? So, um, but yeah, this as a message because I know these questions will uh, uh, earlier or later will be asked. Here, you see the pyramids that I use uh, kind of often um, to visualize what we do. We start with the infrastructure, uh, we crunch the numbers, so work with financial data, we develop strategies, we do backtesting. Uh, both vectorized as well as event-based, right? The one is highly efficient, fast, compact, concise. The other one, much more flexible, a little bit closer to how the real world works. Then we cover connecting code topics, such as connecting to APIs, working with streaming data, et cetera, placing trades, of course. Um, it's in the name, algorithmic trading. There must be some trade execution. Um, I've, I found it always a little bit sad that the successful platform and environment and community of Quantopian uh, yeah, never was really able to move on to uh, trading itself. There have been a couple of um, trials, I must say, uh, but the last mile problem, the deployment gap, as I called it in the context of the AI machine, was never really solved or closed in this context. Automation also pretty, pretty amazing in the sense of, um, yeah, <laughs> There you can leverage and um, and uh, uh, yeah use your tools and skills that you have acquired before. So with 
the AI machine, uh, we have as a preparation the on the masterclass and for selected delegates who are really interested in, they can qualify to use as let's say a beta tester um, the platform, but this uh, is something for later. This is currently not at this point where we are in time, not really relevant. Python for computational finance. Based on the book here, I must say it's indeed based on a book. Um, I was giving um, a lecture a couple of years ago at the university and the book was an outgrowth of that um, lecture. And see, it's also translated like many of my books, uh, basically all have been translated into Chinese. Um, also the newest one, I think it's coming out in, in Chinese. AI and Finance by Algo was translated uh, to Chinese. Um, and here we cover, yeah, the core topics, uh, market-based valuation, the basic idea as compared to theoretical valuation, complete market models such as Black Scholes Merton, um, um, Coxus Rubinstein binomial option pricing, risk neutral valuation, Fourier pricing, theory uh, for your pricing applications, American options or early exercise uh, a bit involved when you do Monte Carlo simulation. So we need these squares Monte Carlo, um, primal dual algorithms in this context, general market model, where we include thoracic short rates, uh, thoracic volatility uh, jumps into our modeling, right? To get a little bit more realistic with regard to our market features at all. Let's say the model features, which should, of course, replicate market features, but the color simulation at the core, calibration of models, um, hedging, review, and practice here in this context. Listed volatility and variance derivatives, um, yeah, about uh, so important asset class these days. Uh, maybe, again, not relevant for everybody, but uh, I would guess, uh, depending on what you do, uh, volatility and variance derivatives uh, might be uh, yeah, a common. Uh, class of instruments that you're dealing with, and this class indeed covers uh, yeah, the most important topics there. Of course, in a, yeah, as usual, in a very practical, applied manner. Of course, providing theoretical background like the model-free replication of variants. Uh, the approach is in this context one of the yeah, strongest and most robust results in quant finance, right? Uh, also, of course, volatility derivatives, which is in the title, and variants derivatives plus modeling and an implementation with the X analytics. So um, the uh, core competition finance class plus the alpha for the VVD class has uh, the Xanalytics components of our open source um, pricing library plus a few add-ons. Speaking of the Xanalytics, um, open source, easy to install. Um, and uh, again, we have several modules which cover um, yeah, basic topics with um, these on it as well as pretty advanced ones, for example, complex portfolios. Um, these are the topics in the computation finance class. In the list of volatility and variance derivatives class, you see here the modules. And here we have like an ongoing um, yeah, sequence of classes, which comes from the quick start to basics about a framework for the simulation, um, simple valuations to the more involved topics, basically everything that you need. Um, with regard to the topics that we cover in our program. Here, the schematic overview of uh, what DX Analytics is about. It's primarily based on the Carly simulation. So we simulate cash flows. We then have wire backwards induction, optimal exercise policies, risk neutral discounting, and we have a non-redundant modeling of risk factors. So the approach here is rather one of a you know, comprehensive systematic risk management approach than traditional single instrument pricing. Right, so we model risk factor one, two, three, non-redundantly. We might have risk factor one, which is relevant for European derivative one and European derivative two, but European derivative two might also be influenced by risk factor two. And here also American derivatives, we have then positions which together form the portfolio where we are dealing with net payoffs, can do um, yeah, risk simulations, what if analysis, um, aggregational creeks, et cetera. So risk neutral discount curve, we have the option uh, of a simple constant um, discount factor uh, or deterministic short rates or stochastic short rates for the X analytics as well. Here, the second pyramid infrastructure as before financial data. Then we move on towards the models, the simulation for your pricing for the calibration. Um, this is much, much faster, of course, than simulation. Then we calibrate the models to liquidly traded vanilla options. 
and do a market-based valuation based on the calibrated models. And last but not least, of course, hedging is possible with these models as well. Python for asset management, the third core topic. Uh, we cover here the basics of risk and return in finance, mean variance portfolio theory, which is at the core of this class. Uh, we, of course, also cover capital market theory, also alternatives to uh, mean variance portfolio theory, such as risk budgeting, uh, a parity, so risk parity approaches. And last but not least here, we leverage also our know-how and the skills from AI machine learning for asset management. For example, to predict um, future expected returns of the assets that we want to invest in. Right? So uh, that's what this class is currently about. It's also a bit of a longer one in the sense of that we have some currently some 17 modules sessions uh, for this class are uh, one and a half hours. Here see the famous bullet, um, portfolio bullet here, right? And uh, as usual, we have the, uh, the videos, resources, uh, codes, executable, downloadable, uh, and many, many examples, plus references to text. So um, <laughs> don't take me by my word. I haven't decided it yet, but uh, I have been approached whether I would like to write a book on Python for asset management. So what I was saying before, uh, I come up with materials for class, we design the class, we, we gain experience, we, we get a feedback regard to the materials and then uh, often, as you've seen before, a book is the outgrowth and uh, one of the next topics might be Python for asset management um, in similar style, so meaning applied practical style as the other ones. Here, the famous paper, uh, the breakthrough, maybe the first real quant model in 1952, the Fourier selection by Harry Markowitz. Um, um, yeah, still a wonderfully readable, uh, text and also available on the web if you want to access it. As I said before, we provide references, right? We we leverage stuff that is in Python for finance. We we leverage stuff that is in artificial intelligence in finance. If you want to have one reference here, it's a book not written by myself. It's, it also doesn't have uh, any real coding in it. It's uh, introduction to risk parity and budgeting, but it's not only about risk parity and budgeting. Uh, the book by Ron Colley. It also covers the traditional, the, the, the basic theory, mean variance portfolio theory. I think a very nice, concise and, and rigorous um, manner here. So I like that book and I usually recommend this as an additional reference on asset management itself. Although the title is maybe a bit more narrow than what is covered uh, in the book in the end. So some case studies um, we have already uh, covered the first two. So I went through uh, the Quant platform. Uh, I have shown how to install a simple Python environment, uh, meaning Miniconda with basic Python plus IPython plus NumPy within a Docker environment. So this is still running in the background. <laughs> so when I don't um, exit it and, and delete the Docker container, this will stick around on my machine. Uh, I will do this uh, later on. And uh, I now want to get started with uh, brief discussion of efficient markets because efficient markets play a role no matter what we uh, do in the um, program um, so here basically instead of reinforcement learning this is a bit too long i have replaced this by um, a quick glimpse at uh, mathematics basics so i i like to do the reinforcement learning but uh, the example there they are simply too long too much code and the execution takes too long so i've replaced this by um by uh, yeah, some examples from the new, the brand new class, mathematics basics. So efficient markets are important for <laughs> our competition finance part, where we do the model calibration in the spirit of efficient markets, where we say, well, we believe in the markets. The market knows what the correct price is for a liquidly traded uh, vanilla uh, put a call, yeah, call put a call option. Um, a quick glimpse at DX analytics in the same spirit. And when we enter the world of market prediction and algo trading, right, with the prediction exercise itself and the Oanda trading platform, then we have the opposite view. We basically say that, or think at least uh, directly or implicitly, that we are able to beat the markets, right? If we are strong believers in efficient markets, why should we try to even come up with uh, predictions? Um, future prices, let's say for the Apple stock or for the Euro US yes, dollar exchange rate or for print crude oil uh, quotes, etc. Um, so <laughs> two 
completely different views. And I don't have here an example because they are usually also a little bit longer for asset management prepared because it's similar in vain to computational finance in, um, in the uh, asset management area. We typically lean to the side of efficient markets and say we, we uh, can influence the portfolio composition with regard to certain statistics and characteristics, uh, but we usually do not try um, to... Um, yeah, to be better than what the markets uh, give us as input. With AI in finance, we might uh, turn this uh, around again, right? But let's have a look. So here I have my um, Jupyter Lab locally efficient markets. So this is from AI in finance about efficient markets. Maybe we can increase it even a bit more. Uh, again, I don't want to teach here now or go into the details. This is just to provide you a glimpse of what to expect, right? So we discuss efficient markets in different instances. Um, a market is efficient with respect to an information set S. Think of a large data set, however large this is and what the composition of it might be, if it is impossible to make economic profits by trading on the basis of information set S. So this basically says we, we are faced with the market uh, if we have maybe lots of data, large volumes of data. And even with the most sophisticated analysis, we are not able to economically profit on the basis of the data that is available to us. So <laughs> I work here with a fixed data set. It's not a large data set. It's just for illustration. And it has a bunch of instruments in here, like uh, two gold ETFs and then your yes dollar quote, gold quote, the VIX volatility index, SPX, Apple, Microsoft, Intel, Amazon, right? And here we see uh, the length of the data. It's um, here for the period uh, 2010 to 2019, including, so from 2516, if we do a drop an A, so get rid of not number values. We can calculate the log returns and financial data science, something that I mentioned uh, quite often, and this is what I would put into the bucket of financial data science, right? So plotting the data, for example. So I can plot the data in normalized fashion. Here I use um, uh, couplings in combination with uh, Plotly in the back end, obviously. So it makes for nice interactive uh, plots. I can also click here and then, uh, take, for example, Amazon out of the a plot in this context, um, I can uh, plot my returns, histograms easily, also interactively with Google FX, or a heat map visualization for the correlation. Of course, here, a perfect correlation between the instruments themselves and low correlation between the wicks and the others, sometimes even negative here, right? A stylized fact, uh, the VIX is highly negatively correlated with its stock index, the SPX, right? So financial data science, I think at its best, but also pretty simple and straightforward. You've seen I've imported the data, I've done a few calculations and then I was good to go uh, for the visualization. So preparing lack data. So this is one of the approaches that you will see regularly that in the spirit of technical traders, where we say, well, let's have a look at the most recent, I don't know, uh, 20, 25, 30, 250 uh, candlestick for example, or whatever the visualization is that you use. And let's try to read something out of the price formation in the past. That's the spirit. It's not exactly the same what I'm doing here, but that's the spirit. So I have prices. I lag the prices here by seven. So seven historical lags. I don't go into the code. We will see the data. In a second, I have seven lags. So when I'm today... Here uh, on Monday, for example, I would have seven lags in the form of last Friday, Thursday, Wednesday, Tuesday, Monday, and plus two, Friday and Thursday. So these would be the seven historical lags. I want to have a look at the Apple price and here the seven lags. I see that the price from the 13th of January 2010 is here for leg one, one row below like two second rows below, etc. So when I have a look here at um, 28, uh, so the 22nd with the price 28.24, this is the previous day's price. This is the 
price from two days before and so forth. So I have now a form of the data where I say, well, I have today's price and I have historical prices. Again, in the spirit of a technical uh, analyst of a technical trader. Right. We so, said, well, let's have a look at the history of the price, price formation, price pattern, whatever uh, you are um, interested in. So here I'm working with prices only. I now implement ordinarily squares regression, where I take my historical prices as the independent variable and today's price, tomorrow's price, so going one day uh, forward, respectively. Um, as my dependent variable. So in the sense of that, we say, well, let's try what we can have a look at historical prices and can use them to predict next day's price. Right? This is what I do here. And we see we get the regression parameters for the seven lags. And immediately we see that lag number one has um, um, an optimal parameter throughout close to one. And all the others are close to zero. This is um, even more impressive, so to say, when we visualize this, right? Here are the optimal parameters for leg one. They are around one, and the rest is around zero. So for the prediction based on ordinary stress regression, basically only the most previous lag uh, is used here. In, in that sense, speaking of efficient markets, this is a text element that I have up here. So in such a case, the best predictor of tomorrow's stock price in a least square sense is today's stock price. So this is one way of interpreting the efficient market hypothesis or random walk hypothesis, right? Um, if we are dealing with random walks, if markets are fully efficient, there is no real meaning in analyzing historical data. And I only need to look at today's price if I'm interested in a good predictor or even the best predictor for tomorrow's price. And this is what we get here based on um, the regression results. And when I take the average, um, yeah, we see yeah, this, the whole story <laughs> even uh, more pronounced, uh, close to one and the rest all close to zero. And you can change it to 17 days. Uh, or just three, uh, the story won't change. So I, yeah, to be honest, I, um, I'm going against a few of the standard assumptions, basically that the lags uh, shouldn't be highly correlated. Um, here they are highly correlated, among others, one of the reasons why we would rather go with the regression analysis with the returns, but here this is just to motivate a little bit the story of efficient markets. So when I go with um, here the um, data, these uh, this is the the lag data, right? Um, I have like one, but I want to get where do I have my? I'm just looking for. That one, that's good. So I can take that one here. And what I want to illustrate is when I go with them and just take the colds. This gives me the lag one to seven. I can then calculate the correlation and we will see that these are highly correlated, right? Um, so uh, <laughs> therefore this result, to put it that way, is not too surprising. Um, because lag two, lag three, lag four, et cetera, doesn't provide any more information, if you want to put it that way, really than lag number one, right? So uh, I'm adding stuff that, uh, yeah, doesn't add any um, information. Therefore, again, I, I, like, I like the approach to motivate the story of efficient markets, but you see I'm doing uh, quite a few things here against the standard assumptions of ordinarily square regression. But we have other tools beyond NumPy, what I've been using, for example, uh, stats models. Um, why do I show this? Yeah, because uh, these specialized statistical models, they give us in general more statistical data and more statistical information about what is um, going on. So covariance, non-robust, um, uh, here, uh, where do we have it? R squared, uncentered, it's, it's pretty high because again, today's price is a good predictor. In general for tomorrow's price, um, therefore R squared, pretty, pretty high. And more statistics here like T statistics, 
um, for the single lags also provide. Just to show that it's not plain vanilla, only what we can do, we can go with more specialized models in this case, instead of NumPy and stats models, and I get maybe a bit more information. So my story was that in computational finance, and in particular when we do model calibration, we try to leverage the market efficiency. Maybe let me restart and save this. Meaning that we take prices for vanilla options that we see in the markets as given, and we recover parameters from our model that we want to use for other purposes, like pricing of other instruments or hedging of certain instruments. Um, oh, yeah, this is what we call calibration. We try to come up with parameters for a model which, as best as possible, um, replicate the prices in the market. Here I go with a jump diffusion model by Merton. This is covered in detail in the comp finance class. I don't want to go here again into the details just to give you a glimpse of what to expect there. I have uh, here the implementation for the Fourier transform based pricing. Um, do a numerical example, right? And the calibration of the model here is done based on a root mean squared error. Um, this is what I was saying. We want to yeah, we try to best replicate option prices that we observe in the markets, right? So importing data, defining certain yeah, parameters plus selecting only a subset of the options, we end up with a smaller set of options um, with the jump diffusion model. Uh, probably I cannot really deal with a large set of options, but with this relatively small set of options that we see here now, uh, the lower the strike price, the higher the, um, the price. So we deal with call options here. And we have the error function that we have seen mathematically before, root mean squared error. And now we do the calibration. This is done by two different approaches that we will repeatedly apply in the computational finance uh, context. The, the first one is a global optimization where we run over, yeah, by brute force, over a larger grid of parameters that we consider sensible. I like to compare this to the Superman flying, I don't know, 10 kilometers above ground. And, then when Superman spots some incident, some, I don't know, burglary or whatever, um, he wants to close in and uh, flies as fast as possible down to earth. And this is what we do with the local optimization. So here we see that the root mean squared error um, improves in the beginning, then it gets worse, improves again, and we keep here track of the best combination. If we use the best combination that we have figured out by brute force now for the local convex optimization. Yeah, Superman taking care of some incident. If we see from the um, original minimum, we now get some improvements. Not that large, but I mean, we are already on a pretty good level. So we ended up with uh, 9.7 and now we have a point. 76 for the root mean squared error. And we can now plot our results with the final row here. And you see that the model um, gives prices like the red dots here and the blue line. These are the market prices. And if I wouldn't show here the differences, we would maybe conclude this seems almost perfect. Here, there might be a difference, right? But the rest looks pretty good. So the red dots lie on the blue line, but a closer look here, at the differences. We see that we have both positive as well as negative differences, which is good. So we don't have biased um, errors, so to say, pricing errors. And the largest deviation here is indeed for the lowest price there. That's what we want to do. And from that point on, we say we have a calibrated model, which is in line with the market, um, at least with the segment of the market that we have picked. And we can now use this model to attack other problems like pricing American options, for example, or pricing uh, exotic derivatives, or whatever we want to do with such a model. Right? So that's what I mean by leveraging efficient markets. We take the prices as given and we recover the parameters for the model at hand from the prices that the market gives us.
and then we speak of calibration. The X analytics, again, a quick run through. Um, we cover here um, the quick start already, the, all the elements of the overview chart when you recall it. So we deal here with a constant short rate. We instantiate environments, so this is what I call it, framework environment. <clears throat> we do some simulation of geometric Brownian motions here. In this particular case, we uh, might come up with a second risk factor, right? So here in terms of uh, the little chart that we had a few slides before, that one, risk factor one, risk factor two, these are instruments, let's say an index or a stock, for example. This is a visualization. And then we can come up with our valuation models for here in this particular case, an American put. Calculate the present value, delta, gamma, vega, theta, rho. All done numerically, but you see it's kind of fast, I would say. It doesn't take too long. The second derivative is here in the example, a European call option based on GBM2. And again, we get our numerics, our creeks here, all from the numerical calculations, not let's say here in this context from uh, black skulls, where we, where we could do this. This is done consistently in a numerical fashion. Then we put, this is now here, we have risk factors. We have now the valuation models and we now need to package the valuation models into positions. So for example, European derivative, we have a position of 1000 of the same derivative, let's say, or uh, three futures or whatever we are going to model. And then we put the positions into a portfolio. So this is the next step. Put position, call position for the portfolio, a few more um, relevant uh, parameters here. And last but not least, we arrive at the portfolio that has now the risk factors, uh, some correlations, if there are any assumed, uh, the positions. Um, and we can then move on and do a simulation and valuation where we get simple values here, right? The value of a single instrument. We have two American single risk factor. So that's the position value. That's the position value uh, times three, right? So this is um, all scaled based on the position. And we can get a few more statistics. You see this took a little longer, but we get by default a position delta and position vega um, here as well. Then risk management, we can do some risk reporting. This is something like a simulation or let's say what if analysis, where we say we have a, a, the risk factor um, GBF1, which is 100 um, initially. And what happens if we um, increase the initial price by 10? So by 10%, here it's exactly 10 in currency units. Here the uh, portfolio value drops. These are like what if or scenario analysis. Same here for the, uh, the deltas, now a bit in a more compact fashion. Then for Vega, the same idea, right? For Vega, here only the values where we have, uh, this is the benchmark. And if we um, increase Vega, um, sorry, <laughs> the volatility by 5%, um, then we um, see here an increase in portfolio value. So volatility increases, um, portfolio value increases as well. So usually we have this uh, positive relationship uh, for at least plain vanilla um, options in this context. Yeah, that's the X analytics. You see there is not that much code as compared to um, the other example, uh, but that's the very idea that we have a package which has the, the code maybe lots of code even, behind the scenes that we can then access. So that's the part here about the analytics. And again, we have uh, examples also um, with regard to volatility and variance derivatives in this context. Um, but here we focus on usually plain vanilla uh, European and American options in this context. But the analytics can do much more. So AI and finance. Um, this is about uh, financial features and market prediction. I said, when I introduced the market, that 
Here, we now take the opposite um, view with the calibration. This is explicit, so to say. We say we take the prices as given, and now we try to beat the markets by trying to leverage data and maybe not something as simple um, and omnipresent as OLS regression, but rather maybe something more sophisticated, such as a deep neural network. Maybe we can do better, maybe much better as compared to simple ordinary squares regression. So we import some data set. Here it's uh, from Wanda or Wanda. Um, I like to pronounce it Wanda. Uh, I read the data. Uh, we see here, this is uh, open, high, low, close, um, complete, yes, throughout. And this is data from the 1st of January 2018 to yeah, end of first quarter 2019. One example from the air and finance class. And now we yeah, let loose in terms of coming up with technical indicators. So first I get started with the... Um, with uh, the returns, then the direction, which I get from the returns, then the difference between close and open, the difference between um, um, uh, here, open, high, low, close. This is um, uh, U minus D up versus down, right? We have here C, O, close and open, right? And we then check whether the market was moving up or down. Um, we have here um, the uh, high minus low, high minus open, open minus. So you see, this is just to illustrate that we can, for the machine learning based prediction, we can include basically any feature that we can derive from price series, from return series, or from whatever uh, data set we might want to include. We only need to make sure, and this is done later on with the lagging, that we are not including data um, which is not available at the point in time when we do the prediction. So we need to avoid foresight bias. That's the major requirement. So um, we have a total of 21 features, uh, length of the data set 15,000. So that's quite a bit. We split into training data, validation data, and test data. I do the lagging by 10. I do Gaussian normalization. So lagging by 10, as explained in the context of ordinary squares regression, the 10 previous data points. So this is now intraday data. Previously, we worked with end of day data. So this is now end of day. So we need to uh, take care or at least have in the back of our head uh, the time interval that we're dealing with because pandas basically doesn't really care, right? So pandas, um, pandas, um, yeah, whether you have end of day data or five minute bars is reflected probably in the um, in the um, in the index, right? But the code implementation might not necessarily reflect. This is the point that I want to make. Right? So the code might look the very same uh, whether we deal with end of day data or let's say one minute bars as as uh, one example. Here, the normalization and the lagging is done. So the length is now 210, meaning we have 21 features times 10 lags gives a total of 210 features. So I can now train an MLP classifier. This means or stands for multi-layer perceptron. That's a deep neural network, a dense neural network with a couple of assumptions there. And let's do the the fitting. Right. So in the meantime, on the platform, let me take this over here. While this is training, I have now the portal from the quant platform open. And what I wanted to show, for example, was in FinPi, for example, here, finance with Python uh, book here, right? Where you have on the quant platform, this is now a bit tiny. On the quant platform, have the uh, codes that accompany the book. This is what I wanted to show before. Jupyter Lab now is up and running again. So this was one point that was missing 
uh, before where I said and emphasized, and I like to repeat myself in this regard, you don't need to type everything or do copy and paste with what you see in the books and the materials, etc. You have access to all the codes that you see, uh, no matter what, in the video recordings, in the live sessions, in the books, and in other places as well. Right? So this is now just what I wanted to um, show you in this context. So I don't want to save anything um, here in this context. This is here you see based PQP. This is similar to what I'm running here, but this is see here local. This is on my local machine. So this took some 4.41 seconds. Um, and um, I can now test the performance of the strategy. I transform my predictions from zeros and ones to minus ones and ones, right? So one for long, minus one for short, multiply with the, the respective returns and see here a outperformance of some, what is it, some seven percentage points on the test data set. So here we see the, um, the performance of the plain vanilla benchmark, so passive long investment and the green one here is the outperformance. Uh, I would say it's not spectacular here. So over that period of time, we also see drawdowns, pretty long drawdown period here as well. Uh, but at least this approach, which simply has added one technical indicator and, and, and statistic after the other, uh, and uses the 210 now to do the prediction we see on the test data set, it is able at least to come up with a statistical outperformance. The question now would be, and this is uh, explicitly stated in the quote by Jensen, which I read aloud before, um, the question is whether we can use the statistical predictions to economically profit from our prediction. That's a different story. So here it's statistics, no transaction costs, no trading whatsoever simulated. The next step, and that's the important one in algo trading, is to come up with a strategy that capitalizes on the uh, better than the market uh, predictions. That is the big, big deal. Also one of the core points that we uh, cover in the program. So. We are closing in and when I was saying about trading, trading is key component because uh, good predictions is just one side of the coin. We need to be able to trade and to execute. And with the example from before, which was based on Euro US dollar, we are in a, in a good position because we can trade uh, currency pairs pretty easily, meaning that transaction costs are in general relatively low as compared to other instruments. And we can go long and short in equal um, fashion. So there's no, not that much of a difference uh, going long and short. There's a little bit of a, a financing going on, etc. But basically we can say, let's go a million long or let's go a million short. And that's not a big deal, even uh, not for retail traders, right? With other instruments, this might be a bit more involved. So here I import a couple of uh, packages as usual. The major one is TPQ OA for the um, trading platform that I'm going to use. I have my personal credentials stored here in a config file, so I don't share that. We explain all the details in the program. And here I see the first uh, four instruments. So I can show I have uh, access to a bunch of instruments. I think it's something like 125. There is um, um, Hang Seng Index, for example, we have uh, uh, commodities like platinum, uh, palladium, uh, we have um, uh, international indices, uh, we have currency pairs, etc. But this might vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. So, um, but for training exercise purposes, teaching purposes, um, you should make sure that when you sign up for a demo account, which is of course not <laughs> regulated in the same fashion as a real account, uh, that you have a jurisdiction such as Germany or the UK where you get access to um, maybe as many instruments as possible. And I think Germany and UK have the maximum instruments with ONA available. So BCO, let's retrieve some data here for pretty current last week, one day worth of one minute bars. So this also depends the number of data points that we get depends obviously on the, the trading hours, etc. Um, and I implement here a momentum strategy. This is by no means as sophisticated as what, what we have seen before done with the MLP classifier model, uh, a dense neural network. This is a simple 
idea that we say, well, we take the average return over for a rolling window of five here, one minute intervals, and we want to trade a momentum strategy. We say that when the average return over five one minute bars is positive, we want to go long and otherwise we want to go short. So momentum, right? It has a positive momentum, we want to go long. It has a negative momentum, we want to go short. Let's see what the hit ratio is. Um, so we have uh, more falses here than trues, right? So we have uh, only a 45% hit ratio, but you will hear me saying this quite often. This is only one side of the coin. The question is whether we get the large movements correct. So we can have a hit ratio of, let's say, 40% only, but if we get the large positive as well as negative movements correct, we can still have a wonderfully profitable strategy. And, and on the other side, when we have like a 55% hit ratio, if we only getting the small, minor, tiny movements correct, then we might still lose out due to transaction costs or whatever. So the vector is backtesting now for the strategy. Gives nothing spectacular. Over one day in the beginning, it's like mixed. And towards the end, it has a slight outperformance. This is just for illustration purposes. And I do uh, obviously some data snooping here that we have a somehow positive result where we are yeah, in a good mood and say, well, there's something maybe to it. I'm not saying that you should do that. We anyways don't. Uh, recommend or recommend against any strategies. This is um, just for illustration purposes, just to, to teach the skills that are required in this context, right? And um, we have here the um, um, the number of trades, and it's already you see it trades 259 times over the course of one day. A loan transaction cost would probably eat up anything that we see here on the statistical side in terms of economic. Profit. So you see here for a pretty short um, interval, just 200 points, you see that it regularly changes here from long positions to short positions. So meaning that, uh, yeah, transaction costs probably eat up anything that, uh, yeah, that might be here on the statistical uh, profit side. And we are also dealing now with uh, BCO, I think I have chosen yeah, it's friend crude oil here the transaction costs are also uh, much higher when compared to let's say currency trading for example so but speaking of trading we still haven't placed a trade right so um let me see whether i can pull up the I don't know whether this is the right account. I have so many accounts these days. <laughs> so once in a while you need maybe to get something new. I have here something running for oh quite a while. This is still like an, an open um, trade trade position. Nothing. Let me see whether this uh, executes into this account here. I create an order. It's a, it's a very small order. Euro uh, GBP. Um, from here, the Jupyter Notebook with my API connection, I can place a trade. You see here the ID, you see the time when a place, uh, the trade was placed, um, the price at which it was executed. This is a simple market order, no limit whatsoever. Uh, PL is zero here. So that's my entry order, no PL, no realized PL. This is only reported when I close the position, which is the next trade. Let me check. Um, and indeed, here. As you can see, I have, oops, I, I wanted to zoom in, not zoom out, actually. It doesn't do it with the uh, ONA here. Uh, Euro GBP, 100 units long, um, and currently the life profit, a tiny thing. I mean, it's just a position of 100, right? The margin is 3 Euro 33, so it's a leverage of 30 here. Um, so it's a tiny, tiny position. It's just for illustration purposes, but you see the, the position has been opened by my code executed here in Jupyter Notebook. And this next one here closes the position, let's see, and it disappears, right? Now we have closed, and when I check activity, on the activity side of things, I see here a couple of uh, elements reported. So I checked this before, you see I've, I've uh, run this notebook for testing purposes a bunch of times, but the last two trades, Buy market order, sell market order um, are reported here, also with the PL. So this is what I've done. Currently, there's no position open because yeah, 
I have opened just one position and I have closed the position. So this is, of course, a prerequisite for algo trading that I'm able to place orders and not only market orders, but also maybe limit orders or in market of touched orders and then other types of orders. And um, here, why doesn't it print the transactions? Let me check. Hmm. Doesn't want to print anything. Um, so usually this should show me the most recent transactions. I don't know why it, what is in the order ID? Let me check because this is set to a case that, and this worked before, 2989. And I don't know why it's not going 8987. So hmm. maybe some. Oh, doesn't want to print. I don't know. Maybe there's some sometimes there's also a hiccup with the API itself. So, but what should be working is streaming data because uh, placing trades is one thing, but we are we are in the position that we need streaming data. I need to be able to process streaming data right here um, to be able to trade in real time. Right, where we generate signals. We need to digest the data in real time. We need to crunch the data. Then we generate the signal. We check the signal against a position that we might uh, be in already. And then we might execute a trade or not. We might wait until the signal is updated or until anything else. Um, so we, I think they also provide live data for uh, BTC, exactly, for Bitcoin. So we can also stream Bitcoin live data here in this context. But this is just to show that we have the capabilities together. This is not putting together all the elements in order to uh, yeah, come up with a um, consistent uh, yeah, strategy code package. Uh, we have the ingredients. We have streaming data. We can place orders. We know how to do predictions. Um, and one of the major things in going from the backtesting and research side of things to the deployment side is to translate your algorithm your back-tested algorithm from what is called an offline algorithm based on static data to an online algorithm where you digest data in real time. This is sometimes tricky, sometimes it is straightforward, but of course also a topic that we cover in the, in the program. So I said it before, instead of a rather lengthy reinforcement learning uh, uh, example that of course you have access to on the platform, I decided to go with uh, math basics ones because this is new. And instead of the maybe quote unquote a bit boring stuff with uh, pure Python, I have here a few examples from Python for finance with regard to SymPy, where we can do symbolic computation. That's wonderful. So for example, you see it already here, SymPy dot square root X, X is a symbol here. This gives me the square root of x. And as you would now manipulate something like that with math, maybe pen and paper, or for those of you who have written or write regularly LaTeX, you would maybe do something like this in LaTeX. I can do now symbolic computation, such as 3 plus the square root of x minus 4 uh, squared. And SymPy already takes over and simplifies expressions. Right? So it takes the 3 and uh, this. Uh, element here and puts them together and shows us a nice cleaned up uh, simplified form. The same holds true here when I define a function f. Right, so I have f now. This does already the trick by itself or I go with um, um, simplify. In this case it is so simple already that it does it internally what I said here but we have simplify and sometimes you might be dealing with much more involved um, mathematical expressions, equations, functions, etc. And then this comes indeed in handy. Right now, I set the printing to um, uh, preprint false. So now, instead of the LaTeX-based output here, right, it gives me ASCII-based output. So 1.5 multiplied by x. Right, and here to the power of two squared. So this looks different. See, this is LaTeX rendering, and this is um, ASCII rendering. So more simpler one. We could have done this on a typewriter back in the days. Right. So here with uh, the square roots, it works as well. Uh, 
I, I like it because it's a bit like uh, ratio. So with regard to number, number theory, large numbers, um, like ratio ones like pi, for example, what I do here is I want to have the numerical version of pi exact to 400,000 digits. And then I transform this to a string. So here I have the first 42, and these are the final 40 of the 400,000. Think of it, 400,000, right? SumPy is your friend when you're dealing with large numbers or exact, or want to get exact numbers. And uh, since this is an infinite string of numbers, we know that every birth date can be found here. And this is a birth uh, date of one of our family members, uh, 6th of October, 1972. And uh, you can search for your own birth. Date. Maybe 400,000 might not be enough. You might go need to go 2 million or what. But if you go large enough, you will for sure find uh, your uh, birth date in pi. Always nice. Equations. So I can solve equations such as the simple ones. Uh, x squared equals 1. We need to get it into a normalized form, which has the 0 on the right-hand side, x squared minus 1. right? And this is what I write down here. So equals 0 is what is implicitly assumed. I get the two solutions here. Uh, that's a pretty simple case here, minus 1 and 1. Or x squared minus 1 minus 3, right? So it also simplifies, of course, here internally what I have um, emphasized before. Uh, cubic ones, ah, here we enter already the world of imaginary numbers for the cubic equation, or we can have also um, two variables x and y, which I have defined previously. Final look at integration. Here I have uh, two more symbols, a and b, and I define an integral over the sine curve plus some linear element. Uh, you see here the integral now from a lower limit to b upper limit, a half x plus sine of x dx. I can integrate now symbolically, right? And I can print the function. This is the uh, function. So this is the antiderivative right here of sine. This is the antiderivative of a half x. And then I can come up with the uh, first expression, second expression by replacing, substituting upper and lower limit when I assume 9, 5, 0 0.5. And that's the integral value. So this would be maybe something that you do manually, step by step, pen and paper. I can put into limits in here, A and B in here, right? So I now have um, integration including A and B. And now, in this case, I can substitute for A, a half, what I've done up here, and for B, 9 point, a half, um, 9.5, and can evaluate the function, which gives me, yeah, apart from the very last digit, basically the same numerical value. Or I can do it in one step. SumPy integrate, SumPy sine plus a half x. x is the um, variable, lower limit, upper limit, and here we go in just a single line. So I'm a big fan of SumPy. Uh, I must confess, I maybe don't use it as often as I should. Uh, but for example, in the mathematics basics class, this is uh, one of the topics that will be covered in um, later um, sessions as well, because it is really powerful. We can come up with derivatives, we can solve systems of uh, linear equations, etc., etc. We have many, many um, options there. So let me restart this here. Um, so this is all emptied and I have done a few changes and I do the update for the gist. You have the link to the gist. In the gist which accompanies today's session you find here the um, you find the um, yeah Jupyter notebooks the six that I've used calibration efficient markets um, AI and finance and yeah the very last one that we have just done with regard to mathematical tools symbolic computation. Right, so that's now updated in the gist. Maybe I should reload it so I can close up that one. And 
This finishes now the uh, demo part. Here is again the link to the gist. And the study plan is something that we have uh, discussed already. So I've explained the connection between um, the, um, the single elements and the quant platform. So the, the bold writing here is about the sessions that we have uh, the reading assignments here. There are the live sessions. This is what financial data science class, tools and skills. Right, so all is found accordingly on the um, on the quant platform. This is mathematics basics, where I have commented that I haven't included this into the plan. This is something you can study in bulk, that you can study um, in parallel to the rest of the program. But I would recommend that you go uh, at least through it um, from A to Z. Maybe not too too intensive, but I'm pretty sure you will find here and there uh, valuable. Um, elements uh, that you can leverage in the other parts. Then, and this might vary from uh, uh, delegate to delegate, depending on what you have signed up for. You might have access to Python for asset management or not. Uh, you might have access to Confinance or not. I have access, obviously, here to everything. Uh, mathematics basics, finance with Python. I explained it before. We have on the course the text. We have here the videos, and we have uh, the code. Same holds true for mathematics basics. So. Now this should uh, work. Let me give it a try, whether it will um, open it. But this should by now be clear. If you have any questions with regard to content, quant platform, whatever, think of the user forum. The user forum should be the first thing that jumps to mind, right? Uh, when you have any questions with regard here to organization. If you have some personal question, uh, organization ones, or I don't know, whatever might come up, um, you can, of course, write us an email as well, but everything related to content, delivery, uh, technical question, code questions, uh, installation questions, etc. the user forum is your friend. And as we go week by week, you will get an orientation email and the study plan will be updated on a weekly basis. So our guiding principles, and I hope I could convey this throughout um, the um, um, demonstration um, is that we have Python first. So even when we talk about computational finance or algorithmic trading, all the classes are Python classes, right? And uh, I said it before, for example, we don't provide recommendations with regard to which strategies to use. We provide examples and uh, implement them uh, in detail in Python, but this is not necessarily any kind of uh, recommendation. We try to be reproducible, which means that um, we work with data sets that are fixed that you can download and um, that you can work with so that you have exactly the same data that is used, for example, in a live session. Uh, it should be specific. So algorithms used, examples shown are specific in Asia and not meant to provide an exhaustive overview. So for example, in machine learning, when I have a look at my, my um, reference shelf here in the back, what types of books there are, like Deep Learning and Python Data Science Handbook, Deep Learning with Python, uh, et cetera. Uh, there's simply too much theory that is behind the practical applications that we, uh, that we have. So we focus on the practical side of things. The algorithms and examples are specific, um, and it's in general not an exhaustive overview of all the details. So with the Mathematics Basics class, we provide to uh, try to provide a stronger foundation on the math side. And maybe in the future we will have, I don't know, something like machine learning basics where we provide a stronger basis with regard to fundamental algorithm. And last but not least, it should be practical. So this is not the theoretical exercise that we do here. You should acquire coding and other practical skills. That's the main goal. So skill acquisition is indispensable. Just watching videos, reading text, doesn't really help you in acquiring skills. It prepares you, uh, it makes you better, more efficient in acquiring skills. But I like to compare this to uh, learning how to play the piano. There is the point where you need to sit down and where you need to practice your scales and where you need to practice your first piece. Um, therefore, uh, here the book, <laughs> Secrets uh, from the New Science of Expertise, doing the stuff, right? Running, playing soccer, playing the piano, playing the violin playing tennis, uh, playing chess, right? You need to do it, you need to practice it. So these are the guiding principles and every once in a while you might want to uh, reference uh, back uh, to, uh, these, um, to these uh, elements there, right? So here, for example, I have now opened um, from the, um, from here, math basics, right? I have opened 
in what is called with us the portal the Jupyter Lab, uh, the Mathematics Basics um, 01 Jupyter Notebook, um, where we cover very basic stuff about numbers, natural numbers, uh, uh, complex numbers, arithmetic uh, with Python, um, properties of sets, etc. Right. So this is uh, all available for you, usually via a single click, or you can download it. I mentioned it before when you say, well, I want to do this locally. You go here, right click, and there is the download button and you can uh, store the code locally and can execute it. It's also a good exercise that you see, oh, well, do I have installed everything that is required, etc. cetera. So um, this is, uh, yeah, in that sense, an open platform where you can get all the codes to whatever platform machine you like to get it. So. Maybe here I simply shut down um, this time. So review questions and exercises. Every three weeks you get a set of review questions. This is more like yeah for you to have a self dialogue and to test yourself um, and to say well oh there is a question oh I don't recall what a technological singularity is maybe I go back to the chapter because it was interesting but I don't recall really the details. Right. So this is every three weeks. So we have four sets of review questions and every three weeks I see a milestone in the program. Then you have exercises, uh, I would say simple ones, sometimes very simple ones, which are pretty close to what is covered in the uh, resources already. Some exercises are more demanding <laughs> because they are uh, much further away from what is covered in the resources. And then we have what we call test projects, sometimes fun uh, test projects like the one here, sometimes test projects that are absolutely focused on a certain topic. Uh, but whenever there is something like saying project, this is more involved than a simple exercise in this context. And if you get stuck with whatever, if you face any issues, go to the user forum, create a new topic. Maybe I should say before you create a new topic, search the user forum and see whether somebody else has ask the question and whether others have answered the question. So that's uh, usually a good point. But if you create a new topic, please, 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 please. <laughs> we even have this as a reminder every time when you open um, a new topic. Uh, reference, please, here the guidelines. Um, sometimes people say, well, in uh, session three of uh, this particular class, I cannot execute the code. Please help. So, I mean, me saying that, you probably recognize that it's pretty hard to help in this context. You first need to ask what exactly do you face, uh, where do you execute it, uh, what is the, uh, let's say, the trace bag, etc. So you should always post minimal, complete, and verifiable code when you face an issue. As little code as possible, provide all parts needed to reproduce the problem. But minimal, right? Sometimes people, they are working on something for weeks on end and then they face an issue and then they post, I don't know, uh, 500, 700 lines of code. It's hard for somebody who hasn't worked on the code to, uh, to digest it, to understand it, etc. So minimal, complete and verifiable. So uh, on the Quant platform, you have a wonderful environment and you can these days, we have recently added that, you can upload uh, a Jupyter Notebook, for example, where say, this is the, the problem that I face on the Quant platform when I execute it, I face the following issue. So verifiable. We can then execute the same Jupyter Notebook and work in the Jupyter Notebook and maybe provide uh, the, um, the, the appropriate solution within a Jupyter Notebook that you can then uh, use further. So please refer to uh, the guidelines here um, in this uh, Stack Overflow uh, post. So Discord server, last but not least, we recently introduced the Discord server to have A, a bit more of a community element, and B, to have a systematic, comprehensive yeah, platform framework where you can post any question beyond what is content-related and technical. Right? So here, please don't post any code. Right? You now know where to post the code. Um, you know, please use this for general discussions like, I'm thinking of a trading strategy. Uh, who else uh, has been thinking of that? Or if you want to, <laughs> let's say, make friends or uh, want to search for collaborators, you can approach people there and, and post your uh, questions. Or if you have general questions with regard to timing, and uh, maybe uh, usually people ask questions about final projects, or maybe you have questions with regard to hardware that you might want to um, 
buy it sometime soon, right? So this is how we see it. It's more like the community aspect. When you when you are at work, you work, and then you might uh, be meeting over a coffee and uh, think of it like meeting at the um, at the water dispenser or over a coffee and discuss everything else beyond the hardcore work or here in our case, study related stuff. So if you haven't signed up yet, uh, you should do so. You can of course use this um, also um, um, <clears throat> um, also uh, alongside the, again, the user form and, and uh, make sure you sign up here. And then we have usually interesting discussions and sometimes also schedule sessions where we can meet together at a certain point in time and then do some live chat, right? So with regard to everything else that is related to infrastructure, uh, uh, wait a bit, everything will be covered in the program. Don't worry at this point, if you have, for example, um, um, if you have, for example, uh, Docker not installed on your machine, this is covered in um, other sessions um, later on. Yeah, and uh, there is, uh, with regard to mathematics basics, there are specific questions. We currently have already 25 modules available, but uh, there will be the 26th one as a next live session um, in our first week here. So we are going to add on top of the 25 quite a few more. And of course, um, the notebooks from today's session are available um, in the gist here. So I can share the link to the gist in the chat, for example, but this has been shared uh, with you as well. Just have a look at the orientation email from this week. There you find the link as well. All right. You should by now have a good overview. You should know where to start, how to get started, what to do first, and which sequence. Uh, you have quite a few options, optional elements, mathematics basics that you can do in parallel, right? Um, there's lots to learn. I'm pretty excited uh, for this new cohort to add new elements, um, to maybe update some interesting things um, that um, yeah, have changed a bit or a bit more over the recent past. But in any case, I'm looking forward to 12 exciting um, weeks with you all together. Uh, Looking forward to the exchanges, the questions, and the sessions with you. In that sense, again, have a great, great start. Um, I wish you all the best and acquire all the Python skills. And one day, black band level might be reachable. And uh, I think this is really a rewarding um, experience from my point of view. In that sense, take care. I see you in one of the next sessions. Bye bye.